be here next Sunday. I'm going to be with my two grandchildren in Georgia, and you're going to have a really good preacher next Sunday, and she's sitting right there, and we're looking forward to Jenna next week. So look forward to that. And are there announcements that uh, we need to share? Oh, I wonder what you're going to say. I also will not be here next weekend, but I am not going to Georgia. I'm going to Branson with a group of friends. So this is my last announcement, for the most part, for um, Vacation Bible School. So make sure that you guys sign up. If you have volunteered, if you signed up to volunteer for Vacation Bible School, um, on that Tuesday, if you could plan on getting to church about five, between 5.30 and 5.45. We'll just go over the lessons and kind of what we're going to do. Um, I'll just give a brief little um, synopsis of what the night's going to look like. No big formal training or anything like that. But if you plan on volunteering, please come that Tuesday night between 5.30 and 5.45. And then also um, Sunday school. Sign-ups are outside on this little table, and we did our first um, Friends and Heroes um, DVD series today, and we learned about Daniel in the lion's den and how not to be afraid and to pray to God. So um, please sign up to fill in for Sundays that we are on vacations or breaks or whatever. So thank you. Tuesday the, Tuesday the 13th, and I'm going to give some of you guys a little call. Um, I've got phone numbers that I'm going to ask them some uh, specific asks, so I got something for you, Jerry. I got something for you. I've, I've learned all your talents, so <laughs> thanks. The worship of God continues. Good morning again. Good morning. 
the scripture for the call to worship is Psalm 8. And so for that, um, I will be singing Psalm 8. to hear the scripture this morning. Please stand 
and let us continue our worship with our call to worship praise song how great is our God <laughs> Testament reading this morning is from Genesis 1, chapters 24, verses 24 through 27. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Let us continue our worship by standing and singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
may be seated. <laughs> the epistle reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 12. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree, agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet each other with a holy kiss, and all the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. May God bless the reading of the word. Thanks. Thanks. We have had the prelude, we've had the psalm sung, we've had the praise song, we've had the hymn, we've had the choral anthem, and this, I'm not sure how many that is, this is either the fifth or the sixth prayer that we offer this morning because when we sing, we pray. Let us continue our praying. 
when we look into the heavens, there is more than any of us can comprehend, Lord. The light from galaxies at the edge of the universe is just now getting here. And your creation is wildly extravagant. New stars formed every day, not just one by one, but hundreds, thousands. A lifetime of study cannot comprehend it all. All this light, all this energy keeps coming and coming and coming. And so when we look at the heavens, the work of your fingers and all the moon and the stars, who are we that you also create and you care for us? And so we, we gather in humility and awe that you care for us, both us and this world and all the worlds and all the heavens and the galaxies and the universe, more than we know. And the more that we know, the more grateful we are. And yet sometimes, sometimes, Lord, we forget. We, we become arrogant. It's all about what we know. While beauty and wonder walk freely, we focus on our box, on ourselves, our needs, our happiness, Forgive us and keep sending the light from eons ago to remind us just how huge you really are and that we are a part of something incredible. Lord, as we reach for the, the prayer list this morning and just touch it, we remember all the names on our list as you are providing for them either in this life or the next, we also remember and lift up to you right now the names that are not on that list, but in our hearts. Remember those who are very sick, those in deep trouble, those without a home. We see them almost every day. We hear about them almost every day. We remember all those who depend on the blessing box and those too far away. And for those in our own families in need of hope and healing. Lord, in your spirit, send your spirit. Lord, send your spirit. And now we pray in the spirit of Jesus, with Jesus, the prayer that he gave us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is so awesome that he gave his life here on earth so that we would be forgiven. Let us rejoice in that. Let us praise him with um, hymn 422. Let us talents and tongues employ. Jesus. 
Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, loves around. Jesus calls us in, sends us out, bearing fruit in our world of doubt, giving us to tell, bread to share, God Emmanuel everywhere. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, loves around. One of the table rituals speaks of the outward signs of the inward and the spiritual grace. And Paul talks about things seen and unseen, and when we look down the road, what do we hope that our congregation will look like? Is it a full house? Is it lots of young people? What do those new faces look like? What does a healthy church look like? We <coughs> bring those questions in here around the mystery of this table because we see the visible bread and we see the visible cup, but those are the signs of an outward and a spiritual grace, but they are visible signs. It's the Lord's body that is broken for us. So as we partake of this loaf and this cup, the spirit of Jesus grows us to look and to feel more like him, like him for others. And so, once again, we remember that on the night that our Lord was betrayed, that he gave thanks, he took the bread, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat of this as often as you do in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks for it, and he said, this cup is a new blood, in my covenant, which is poured out for you and for this whole sinful world, as, you of, as often as you drink this, remember me. And so we gather and we give thanks for this incredible gift. Father, <clears throat> Father as we approach your table today, we do so in, in humility and awe all of all of the things that you have done for us, the sacrifices that you made. May we just rejoice in this time that we celebrate together with you as we, take, as we partake of these emblems. May we do so in remembrance of you and just thanking you for your blessings, how you have blessed us. We give you praise and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
the body of Christ broken for us, the blood of Christ shed for us. And we remember for as often as we eat this bread, drink this cup, that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Thanks be to God. So the book of Acts, which is where we are today in the scripture text, but there's another story about a husband and a wife who pretend to be generous in their giving, but they're not. Our culture presses us and pressures us to appear better or smarter or more dignified, more successful than we really are. And as adults, many of us um, are hiding. We try to hide the parts of us that are unacceptable, even to ourselves. It's a rough way to live, but that's what the culture does. Acts says that who we are and what we do and what we bring is okay as long as we are honest about it. If it's a tithe, okay. If it's only a penny or a dollar, it's okay. We tell God by our giving who we are. Trust the Holy Spirit to grow you into what God created you to be. And so we give thanks for the giving and the receiving. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before thee this glorious day. We praise thee the opportunity that you have given us to come to your sanctuary and return just a portion of the material blessings that you have given us. Father, we thank you. We ask you to utilize these funds in furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. We pray this in the name of your sacred son, Jesus. Amen. All right, kids, come on up here. Good morning. I have a question for you all. Where is heaven? Cash? In the air. 
in the in the air, so, like up up in this. Okay, um, all right. Hold on, then let me see something. This should help, right? Do you, do you think, come, here, come over here guys, come here so you can see. How's that? So you're thinking like up here maybe? Uh, no. No? Huh? Oh, so we would need like a really long ladder. Higher than the sun. <coughs> okay, well how do you, how do you, so to get to heaven, you need to have a lot of ladders. Like you stack them. What do you think, Logan? You're thinking about something that's not going to work? 10,000. 10, yeah, OK. All right. All right. Take a seat. Take a seat, guys. OK, take a seat, Logan. OK. Well, I think in order to get to heaven, it's a little bit more about just like stacking ladders and stuff. I think that we have to do some, we have to do some good deeds and stuff, right? That's well, at least that's what people think. People think like in order to get to heaven, uh, they have to maybe feed the poor, feed the hungry, right? That's okay. That's one step, right? Um, all right. What if we, what if we all love each other? That'll help, right? Okay, that's another step. Okay, all right, we're getting we're getting closer. What if we give all of our money to uh, to like the church? That should cover us, right? There. Okay, we're getting closer. Yeah. All right. So we got the money, we got the love, we got the service part. That should guarantee it, right? Why? No. Why not? You're not sure? Okay. Well, God actually had a better idea. God knows that we can't really ourselves get ourselves to heaven, right? It doesn't matter how much money we give the church or how much help we give other people or how much we love one another. That, those are all really good, important things to do, but that doesn't necessarily mean all the ladders are going to lead you to heaven. Those are good things to do. But God thought that is a lot of work for one person to do. He decided he was going to stack the ladders and come down. In fact, God said in the Bible, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So God came down here to help us, to save us, to get to heaven. So what helps us to get to heaven is if we help those in need, if we love one another, if we can give any extra money or any funds to help other people, to help the church, right, to serve, right? If we read the Bible, these are all really good things to do. But what is going to get us to heaven, the only thing that's going to get us to heaven, is Jesus, right? So that is what we have to remember today, okay? So let us pray. Let's fold our hands. Dear Lord, help us to remember and appreciate that this life is about you. Help us to keep our focus on your love your service, your works. Help us to serve others through you. Help us to open our pockets and our minds and our Bibles all in your name. Lord, we are so grateful for this church. We are so grateful for these children. We are so grateful for this community. Lord, please help us to remember that our hearts and our minds they should always be turned towards you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's go to Children's Church.
Can you help me, guys? Come here. You know, you could just leave that here for next week. <laughs> Thank you. Give a preview of what you're going to get. I, I really, really enjoy being among you. Uh, one of those occasions was right there at the communion table. Did you notice that I got the uh, prayer, the blessing, dedication out of place? And I said something to Don about it after we sit, sat down. And you know what he said? I think it ought to be that way every Sunday. <laughs> I said, what are we going to do? He said, I'm going to put the offering down and we're going to go sit down. We've already prayed. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. If you can be that flexible, good things are going to come. By the way, uh, we also need to remember um, Kevin uh, announced... Uh, that the uh, tomorrow evening the uh, search team is going to meet with our uh, regional uh, pastor Pam Holt um, to start some discussion. So we remember the search team and and their conversation and their beginning to search. Um, I'm going to find the scripture that I'm supposed to read. I'm sure you see it somewhere. It's out there. Acts two. Here we go. By the way, you'll hear me referring to Luke, and just to remind you, uh, Acts, A-C-T-S, is the second part of Luke's gospel. Jesus ascends to the Father, and then we're on the Spirit coming to the church, and this is the second Sunday in Pentecost. I walked out without my little, um, my robe thing, and so I'm, um, I, I, you're going to go get it for me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right. So here we go. We're going to read the uh, chapter 2, and this is uh, how Luke envisions the Pentecost experience. When the day of Pentecost had come, there were together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one, and these are Jews, heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed, astonished, they ask, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed. All were perplexed, saying, well, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they're just drunk. <laughs> well, that's what it means. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, we're, we're two Sundays now in Pentecost, and uh, I have an initial six-month covenant with this congregation, which means that I'm going to be with you between now and the next to the last Sunday of Pentecost. So that's pretty much the whole season, and that goes through November. And that is a long time, or... It used to be a long time. In the office this week, Christy and Susan Black were talking about Vacation Bible School, and uh, that's just around the corner, unless you don't know that. 
And Susan was saying that with school starting so early now, we have to get things done more quickly. So school just closed, and now it's vacation Bible school. And do you have any idea when school, school starts again? August 10th. August 10th. <laughs> Maybe you have noticed that by July, the rest of the year seems to tip and to begin sliding faster and faster down the hill. There's going to be school in August and then, well, football season. And then it's Halloween, and you know what comes after that. It's over, folks. <laughs> Pentecost is not just a placeholder before Christmas. Pentecost is this church doing the work of Jesus right now. Everybody knows that we're between ministers, and uh, we're trying to... Uh, to take an inventory of what this congregation is all about. What do we do well? Uh, you, you think about, well, we got to improve all this list of things that we don't do well. No, you don't start there. You start with the things that you do well, and then you amplify that. So what is the Spirit of Jesus doing here? And, and how do we find a pastor that matches our gifts? And, and we're in the heart right now of the Spirit's work. It, right now, tomorrow night, the Spirit's about, uh, around us. Last year, or last week in John's Gospel, the disciples were living in fear behind closed doors. And I just got out of a Sunday school class where they were talking about fear. So Jesus comes through the fear, and he breathed on them, and he breathed among them the Holy Spirit. So that spirit, that breathing into us is happening right now. The disciples, disciples' fear was specific. Uh, they feared the same people who killed Jesus because they just might come and crucify them also. Now these leaders, the keepers of the temple, these people that they were fearing were actually fellow Jews. Uh, they were the keepers of the law, and they, they were afraid too. Jesus scared them. He broke so many laws. They were the keepers of the law. The first commandment says that the Lord our God is one, and there are no others. And Jesus' followers called him Lord, and they called him Son of God, and there was no way that these folks who were charged with keeping the law were going to let that one slide. So, so Jesus' enemies saw themselves as the preservers of order, the keepers of authentic tradition. And, and there was a leader named Saul who was really serious about this, about persecuting those enemies. And yeah, he was killing some of those. This is serious business. These folks saw themselves as doing the right thing. So the disciples lived in fear of their own people. Jesus literally appeared behind locked doors and he breathed his spirit into them. And it's the same words that are in Genesis with, with Adam and Eve where God fo uh, formed them and breathed into them the breath of life. And so the breath of the spirit is inside of each one of us, just like God breathed originally into Adam and Eve. And this breath is also inside and among us, this fellowship and this church. So today, I promised that we would go over to the other Pentecost story. If you remember the barbecue story, this is a different taste. It's the festival of Pentecost and the streets of Jerusalem are full. And so think about Mardi Gras down in New Orleans. Luke says that the Holy Spirit came amongst the gathered disciples and fell upon them with tongues of fire and the doors opened and they went out and they proclaimed on the streets of Jerusalem, a crowded Jerusalem, in multiple languages. Now, when I first came into ministry in the 70s, speaking in tongues came spilling out 
of Pentecostal traditions into more mainline churches, and nobody had any idea what to do. So I remember R.D. R.D. and I were both students up at Enid at Phillips. I was in the college. He was in the seminary. And years later, I don't know how this happened, but years later, both of us ended up in an obscure little county over in Georgia. And so by that time, R.D., I didn't know this, R.D. had received the gift of tongues, and suddenly he was on fire. And I mean, he was on fire. Now, in those days, we had uh, cassette tapes, and some of you, just a few of you, remember those. <laughs> and R.D. had boxes of those tapes on multiple tables outside of his office, and he was those were copies of his sermons and copies of his teachings, and he was mailing them out all across the country. R.D. was on fire. Now, he had the Spirit. And then there was me <laughs> and the rest of us. He and other Pentecostal pastors uh, conformed to the belief that there were two baptisms. First was the water baptism, which sort of got you in the door, you're now a part of the body of Christ. But then there was a second baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which included the gift of tongues. So there were two categories of Christians. There were the baptized, and then there were the spirit-filled baptized. And uh, one of the manifestations of that is that uh, they spoke in tongues. So what happened was uh, this division wrecked churches. Anything that divides the church, I'm just going to say it again, anything that divides the church between better and best is not the work of the Spirit. So the genuine work of the Spirit is what unites and brings us together in spite of and sometimes because of our differences. And that's a hard thing to do, but it is doable. But it's only doable because we've got some power going there. If it divides the body, it's heresy. So ch several churches were wrecked by this division, including the last church that I served. In that congregation, at least a dozen families followed that pastor who spoke in tongues outside the doors of the church. They just left, and that happened during the 70s. That took about half of the body of that congregation I talk a lot about critical mass. You've got to have enough people together to do something, and they lost their critical mass, and they never recovered it after that. Division is not the work of the Holy Spirit, even as well-meaning as you may be. So now, to be fair, speaking in tongues is a legitimate form of prayer, both in the early church Paul had it in, in his churches and in Pentecostal churches today. It has a fancy name, speaking in tongues, it's called glossolalia. Uh, Paul had churches that spoke in tongues, and Paul called it one of the spiritual gifts. But it was one among, well, it depends on how you count and which books you're looking at, but somewhere between one of 24 or 36 spiritual gifts. So speaking in tongues, though, is not, a requirement to be a Christian or a better Christian. So in those early days, we all got wrapped up in Pentecost as a speaking event. We, we spent a lot of energy talking, 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 talking. What was said, who said it, how it was said. And we got so wrapped up in talking that we forgot that there was another side to Pentecost. Hearing, listening. Pentecost is not only a speaking event, Pentecost is a hearing event. For every speaker, there must be a hearer. So in order to, to hear what Luke was saying, we have to know that Pentecost is not one, but two celebrations. Now, I don't want to get get too strung out here, but just hold on. 
One celebration, like we talked about last week, was the harvest celebration where the farmers brought their, their grain harvest in and, and first fruits of their grain harvest and offered a few shocks of grain as a, as a sacrifice of thanksgiving in order that God would bless the rest of their harvest. And so that was one of the reasons they were in town. But there was another second celebration going on. And uh, this celebration is God giving the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai. That is a second celebration at Pentecost. Now, I want, to, I want you to listen to this. I didn't tell the, the staff here to uh, put this up, but uh, listen to this. It's Exodus 19. On the morning of the third day, when there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud of smoke on the mountain and a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the, the Hebrews who were in camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now all of Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke. And because the Lord had descended upon it in fire and the smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln while the whole mountain shook violently. That's the giving of the law. Now, listen to Luke. This is Pentecost. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. Luke is talking to Jews, and Pentecost is a Mount Sinai event. The shaking, the violent wind, the fire descending from heaven. This is another manifestation of the presence and the power of God. And when you know that Old Testament and then you hear what Luke says, you begin to see how much bigger this thing really is because Luke is speaking to Jews. And he goes on to say, Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven saying, uh, living in Jerusalem, and the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard him speaking in their own language. And there's about 16 of those. All different kinds of native languages. And Luke is specific. Those who heard the disciples speaking weren't just street people, but they were specific people. These are devout Jews from every nation under heaven now living in Jerusalem. So what's going on here? The first hearers of Jesus' death and resurrection in each one of our Gospels are Jews. Jesus was a Jew among Jews. He came among them preaching and teaching and healing, and some of them heard him and believed him, which was counter to their training. But they heard and they believed. But some did not. It was the majority who did not. Pentecost is the good news of Jesus, now resurrected, coming to the Jews for a second hearing. They didn't hear the first time. Let's try it again. So the Spirit is returning to them to make sure that they hear, they each one hear in their own language. I am listening to some of you, and some of you have got what I do not have, the travel bug. Some of you are sitting there and said, I cannot wait to go on vacation so that I can leave here and go there. And uh, well, where are we going? We're going to go someplace that we like to be. And for some of us, it's the mountains, and some of us, it's the seashore. <sighs> some of us, next week, it's going to be grandchildren. But I can't tell you how much I do not like to get on the plane and travel and pick up the car. And uh, it's, I, you know, it's like going to a football game. And I just love to be among all the crowd and the music and the $20 hot dogs. And <laughs> well, the refrigerator at my house is right there, and the hot dogs don't cost $20. And you can see every play really up close. Why do you need to be at, well, anyway, you get it. I do not have the travel bug. I love all kinds of foreign food. The more exotic, the better. But I don't care about 
the way Anthony Bourdain goes. He, he goes to Vietnam and samples street food. I mean, I'd like to sample it, but I don't want to go to Vietnam. And he goes and samples Indian food and all these varieties of food and all these varieties of districts all over India. I like the food, but I don't want to go to India. And, and, and he goes to, uh, to Italy and, you know, the food in the north is not like it is in the south and all these various, there are kinds of variations of pasta and sauce, but I like that, but I don't want to go there. And, and maybe it's because when I was 17, um, I got the trip of a lifetime. My father was married to a school teacher uh, right outside of Chicago, and they had an incredible experience. They took a group of students every year for a six-week tour of Europe, and I got to go on that tour. So six weeks. And just recently, I came across the, the diary I kept at that time, <clears throat> 55 years ago. And here's an, you know, it's just, can you really say that? Is that really true? 50, anyway. <laughs> here's an entry I had totally forgotten. After seeing London and then the cliffs of Dover, we crossed the channel. We left behind the English language for Belgium where Dutch is the official language. However, it is followed by French and if we didn't have a tour guide, I would be lost. I have never been where they didn't speak English. Our evening meal was lamb and vegetables served by a waiter who came by with a silver tray and a set of tongs. And he served each one of us from the tray, first the lamb and then the vegetables. I had never had anybody serve me off a silver tray before. <laughs> and the language all around me, well, that was just as far as being served off a tray. When the waiter came to our table, some of our students, because they're smart, spoke, spoke to him in French, and he responded in French. And when he got to me and served my plate, what did I say? Thank you. And he said, you're welcome. <laughs> and it turns out that he was an American. And he was working his way across Europe slowly, waiting tables as he went. I felt comfortable because I was in Belgium, which is a foreign land. And I heard, thank you. You're welcome. Wow. In the Pentecost story, Luke is hinting everywhere that Jesus is not a stranger and Jesus is not their enemy. He is from the same culture. Later on this chapter, Luke goes on to quote a Jewish prophet Joel who says, more or less, God wants you to understand what God is doing. God is speaking in these languages so that you will feel included. The first step in listening is to hear, to really hear. In 1992, a fellow by the name of Gary Chapman wrote a book, The Five Love Languages. You may know it. After years of counseling couples, uh, uh, Chapman began to see that couples or parents with children or siblings had a hard time getting along because they weren't hearing what the other one was saying. A wife would complain that her spouse was always keeping the car repaired and the grass mowed and the gutters clean, but he wasn't paying any attention to her. Or two siblings weren't getting along because one was always going somewhere else and never spending any time with the other sibling. They were like strangers. And so Chapman said, it's not like they don't care for one another. They're just speaking different love languages. Over the years, he identified five basic expressions of love. Quality time, you know, paying attention to the other, maintain eye contact, don't 
sit there reading your phone now, or used to be the paper while the other is talking to you, look at them, talk to them, be interested. I mean, really interested. Another one is a gift of giving. It can, doesn't have to be big things. It could be, you know, a, a cup of coffee. Let's go share a cup of coffee. Sometimes with that loved one, it can be something bigger. But gift of giving. And then there's acts of service, A-C-T-S, acts of service. And physical touch, well, those two, acts of service, physical touch, kind of explain themselves. One of my wonderful friends remembers her days as a, a, a small child at First Christian Church in, um, in a town in Arkansas. Her mommy and daddy, and you know, a lot of us don't have that anymore in tact families, but she remembers her mom and dad. And there were three little girls, dump, dump, and dump. And they came to church and they all sat on the same pew when he wasn't serving communion. And so there would be a mom on one end, the dad on one end, or maybe the dad on one end and the mom on the middle. But every Sunday, her dad would stretch his hand out as far as it'd go in that pew and cuddle, snuggle up to as many as he could reach. The gift of touch, physical touch. Words of affirmation saying, wow, I really appreciate that. Shramanka Grimaldi, I have to try to pronounce that. Uh, she called two weeks ago when I was on my second day here, and she was trying to move her and her two children to North Carolina to escape abuse, violence. And she called the church. She was trying to get her children and her possessions out of here to get to North Carolina. And the U-Haul plus the gas was going to be $1,000. And I know that you've got, i would just been instructed just the day before that you have a, uh, a fund for things like that. So uh, we told her that we could help some, uh, but we... We said, we can give you a little seed money, but you're going to have to call around and get others to help you too. And it took her 10 days. And every once in a while, she would call the office and check in, and uh, Christy would, would just encourage her. I was here Friday afternoon. Christy had already left. The alarm hadn't gone off yet, and I was trapped in here, didn't know what to do. But that's, that's another story. And... The phone rang. Well, I got a choice. It's Friday afternoon. I don't, you know, somebody may be calling with an emergency and then, you know, what do you do? But I decided to answer the phone. It was Shemaika. And she said, I just want you to know that I'm in North Carolina. And she said, I am so grateful to this congregation because you helped me, and you encouraged me to have the courage to call other people. But she was motivated, and she did it. We gave her a seed gift, and she went out and kept asking. And she returned words to us of affirmation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sometimes we connect, we speak, and we connect effortlessly. And sometimes we need to listen to make a connection. Maybe to listen differently. Pentecost is the gift of God speaking. And Pentecost is also the gift of us listening. Doors of this church are open. The doors of this church are open to you. If God is speaking and you are beginning to hear, 
or if those words are connecting at a level where they've never connected before and you see that this is real, it's about your life and it's about the difference that God makes in your life and you want to come and commit and connect with that Christ who is in you and who is shepherding you, then the doors of this congregation are open for you to come as we sing our, our hymn of welcome. earlier today from the letter was from 2 Corinthians. This is one of the oldest benedictions that we have in the Christian faith. I want, to hear, I want you to hear the first part because the second part is very familiar. But hear the first part. Agree with one another. Stop fighting. <laughs> Live in peace. And the God of love and peace is and will be with you. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always.